There we go. All right. So with that out of the way, I would like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Lou Prosperi. Oh, just one, one second here. Where did my prompt go? Okay. There it is. Lou has over 30 years of technical writing experience and is currently a senior manager of documentation and curriculum at Oracle based on Burlington, Massachusetts. He styles himself as an Imagineer evangelist and has two books published on the subject. The first being the Imagineering Pyramid and the second being the, being the Imagineering Process. Both are available on Amazon, I'm sure available from other sites as well. So everyone, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Lou Prosperi. Woo! Thank you very much. So I'm going to share some slides here and let's see. There we go. Just make a couple of adjustments. So thank you very much for, for coming and uh, for your, well, it's, um, if you're interested in my presentation, um, so, as Rachel said, my name is Lou Prosperi, and I currently work as a senior manager of documentation and curriculum for Oracle Utilities. A little bit about me, just to provide a little bit more details. Um, I guess it's closer to 30 years. This might be a little out of date, um, but I worked for many years as a game design, game designer and writer. Uh, I worked as a technical writer, instructional designer, and um, more than 10 years as a manager. And as Rachel mentioned, I'm the author of two books. The, outside my um, writing as a game designer, I, I had several publications as a game writer. I worked in the adventure role-playing uh, field. And as she mentioned, my two books are The Imagineering Pyramid and The Imagineering Process. And these are about taking principles of Disney Imagineering, um, which is the the, um, how the Disney folks make the, the parks basically and applying them to other creative ideas. Um, one minor correction, they are available only on Amazon because it's through uh, print on demand. So they're not available other places, but they are available in print and in Kindle. So let's dive in and do an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, as you will see, I'm a, I'm a big believer in starting with the overview. We'll get to that later. So as an introduction, we're going to talk a little bit about technical communication and imagineering. And we're going to talk about what those what what we mean by both of those and what I mean in my title about the technical communication toolbox. And then we're going to take <clears throat> an imagineering storytelling tour of the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World in Florida. Um, and we're going to explore a number of principles, imagineering principles, and how they're used to tell stories there. And then um, for each of those principles, I have a checklist of questions to sort of help us learn a little bit more about them, and then some closing thoughts. And then I'm happy to stay on later to chat about any of this. Please mute themselves. Thanks. So technical communication and imagineering. So when we think about technical communication, do you ever think about what's in your technical communication toolbox? So we think about technical communication and we think about the tools there. Most of them, a lot of times are gonna be these things that are popping up, right? When we think about the tools that we use, um, the thing about this is so many of these really, when we think about it, are all about the technical side. So and when we think about technical writing, there's two aspects to the technical side. One is that we often write about technical subject matters, right? Uh, software, implementation, hardware, manufacturing, etc. But also the way in which we write is a very technical, uh, in a very technical style. Um, and it occurs to me that at conferences and its talks and things far too much of it, in my opinion, is about the technical side of things. How to use Adobe FrameMaker, how to get more value out of your data, how to do single sourcing, how to use Madcap Flare, Data Open Toolkit. Um, a couple of the tools I have here, style guides and the manuals of style, those are a little less on the technical side, but even then, even then they are very much about the, the, the technical aspect of writing. What I find missing in a lot of what we talk about is the communication part. Where can we, you know, where can we find principles of communication and, and where do we don't focus enough on how people communicate with each other. So, you know, even though we all are technical communicators, um, I think it's worth stepping back and really looking closely 
at what we mean by this. And so I looked up a couple de de dic uh, dictionary definitions, you know, according to Oxford, communication is the imparting or exchanging of information or news or the successful conveying or sharing of ideas and feelings. So if we want to simplify that a little bit, which is one of the things we all do, right? We rewrite things. People give us raw content and we rewrite it to make it more, uh, hopefully, uh, a more effective communication. When we talk about communication, we're effectively conveying concepts and information to an audience of some sort. But as I asked before, we can look for, we can find all sorts of tools about using DITA, using this tool, using that tool, single sourcing, um, elements of style, manuals of style, but where can we look to find information about principles of communication, how people exchange ideas? And so my answer and my solution comes from an unexpected place. Now, when I say that, I don't mean completely unexpected. I'm not gonna surprise you because you saw the title of the presentation, you saw you know, the word Disney and Imagineering in the title. So it's not a huge surprise, but I do think it's an, an unusual place or a non-standard place. And so my answer is to look at Disney parks. These uh, are pictures of um, Cinderella castles in the middle, Spaceship Earth is on the left, and uh, the Tree of Life, uh, Spaceship Earth from Epcot, by the way, and Tree of Life from Animal Kingdom, all at Walt Disney World. And so my answer is Imagineering that's where we can look for principles of communication. So, but what, what do you mean? What's imagination? What's Imagineering? Well, let's look. So Imagineering technically is what's known as a portmanteau, which is the, the, a word formed from two other words. And in this case, imagination and engineering. And though it's often uh, credited to Walt Disney, the, to the term was also originally coined by the Alcoa Corporation in the 1940s. But Walt um, sort of took it and popularized it when he talked about it on the Disneyland TV show when Disneyland opened. And I like the, the definition Walt used, um, where he said, this is part of a larger quote, but we call it Imagineering, the blending of creative imagination and technical know-how. And what I like about this is it it emphasizes the creativity, but it also broadens, it's not just engineering, it's technical know-how of different types. And so I strongly believe that um, a, a, file or a file clerk or an administrative person who comes up with a new creative way of sorting files and, and information may be imagineering their job. So I think this is a very broad term about applying creative imagination and whatever your technical know-how is. And this this speaks to the roots of Imagineering. When Walt was dis, uh, designing Disneyland, um, he originally talked to architects. And one of his friends was a well-known architect in the Los Angeles area named Welton Beckett. And he's, he was explaining his concept and Welton Beckett basically told him, you know, you're going to need real engineers, you're going to need real architects, but really you need to work with people that understand the storytelling that you're talking about. And so he encouraged him to look look uh, at his own studio at filmmakers and art directors and animators who understood his style of storytelling. And those original Imagineers adopted storytelling techniques and principles from filmmaking and animation when they designed Disneyland. So they borrowed ideas from one field and applied them to this other field. And we can do the same thing. We can take principles of Imagineering and adopt them and adapt them to what we do. So let's look on a little bit. So at the heart of what the Imagineers do is effective communication. The Imagineers use a wide variety of disciplines and techniques and tools to convey specific ideas and experiences to their audience. Whether those experiences may be the idea of Pirates of the Caribbean or a haunted mansion or Space Mountain, whatever it is, or, you know, adventure land, they are conveying specific ideas and experiences to their audience. And these ideas and experiences are their stories. Now, in this case, story I'm using as a shorthand for the core idea or premise that underlines each attraction or venue or land. So we're not talking necessarily story as in narrative, beginning, middle, end, denouement, rising action, etc. But 
again, the shorthand for this core idea or premise. And so when the Imagineers tell a story, they're communicating an idea, which brings us back to what I was, what, you know, our definition of communication, effectively communicating concepts to an audience. So we can look for principles of communication uh, by looking at how the Imagineers tell their story. So we're going to look at how the Imagineers tell their story in the parks as models for how we can communicate ideas. So we're going to start with a, we're going to take an Imagineering storytelling tour of the Magic Kingdom. So here's a map of Magic Kingdom in Florida. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through and look at examples of 15 different principles at work. Um, and I'm not going to read these all here because we're going to get to them, but we're basically going to walk down Main Street USA up to the castle. We're going to take a left turn over to Liberty Square. From there, we're going to go down into Adventureland. Then we're going to move up into Frontierland. We're going to cross back through Liberty Square over to uh, Fantasyland, and we're going to end there. And along the way, we're going to look at these various principles and how the Imagineers use them to tell their stories and, and what the underlying uh, principle at work is and how we can apply it to what we do. Um, and when I, when I say technical communication, I, I should be clear, I want to include instructional design and curriculum development, not just pure documentation, technical writing. So the whole sort of info dev uh, world that we live in, uh, because I expect a number of you like me have to do both of those. So, um, so let's start. Uh, with something, a term that Walt Disney coined called weenies. And as we walk down, as we enter Magic Kingdom and we come through under the tunnels underneath the railroad station and we walk around the town square, we see this at the end of the, of the far end of Main Street USA, Cinderella Castle. And this is what Walt called a weenie. <clears throat> and uh, the, tor the term comes from, it's related to hot dogs. He had a, uh, a dog named Dutch that he used lead around the house with hot dogs. Um, so he me as a visual magnet that draws people in. And really, you know, when we think about what this is, is it's something down an aisle way or a walkway or an alleyway that says, hey, I have a story to tell, come check me out. And so this is one of the, you know, the first things we're gonna see when we come here. And so when the Imagineers tell their story, they attract the audience's attention to their interest. So they want to grab their audience's attention and say, I have something I'm interested to tell you. So in our world, what, you know, how can we do that? You know, I think um, chapter titles and contents can work as a weenie. So if we're thoughtful about the way we, we name the chapters of our content or the sections of our content, I know we don't work on books anymore. A lot of us just write content, you know, this sort of nebulous transaction of information about a subject. Um, but if we're thoughtful about the, the way we name things, um, obviously we're gonna use parallelism because that's the kind of people we are. But if we're thoughtful about how we do it, we can alert to our, our readers that we have something of interest, of their interest. Um, another way to do this, I think, is in, you know, what are called advanced organizers. You know, at the beginning of a section or chapter, you may see a short bulleted list of headings that sort of correspond to the sections you're going to see. Uh, I know there's some debate in the community, or there has been over the years, about uh, when it comes to minimalism, if those are really worth it. In my opinion, they definitely are because it tells the reader right away what they're going to see in the next section of content that they're looking at. So it sort of helps guide them. So that's a weenie. So we see Cinderella Castle and we we head down and we can't wait to see what's what's more, you know, what what else there is to see. And we're going to look at Cinderella Castle a couple more times. Um, so we attract the audience's attention and we capture their interest. The next principle is a fundamental one. Uh, in Disney, and that is it all begins with a story. Everything the Imagineers do is informed by a story. There is a story or backstory or history behind everything they do. And one of the greatest examples of that is this place at the corner. As you come down Main Street, USA, at the end on the left-hand side, um, right before the hub, which is the big open space in the middle, <clears throat> is this restaurant. You can I don't know if you can read the sign under above the Coca-Cola, but basically it's called Casey's Corner. It's a hot dog uh, restaurant. 
Originally, it was called the Coca-Cola Refreshment Center, and it's still sponsored by Coke, as you can see. Um, and it's based on a poem and an animated short called Casey at the Bat. Um, the poem was from the 1800s, and Walt Disney uh, did a, an animated short in the 40s, I believe, called Casey at the Bat. And this whole restaurant is inspired by that. And this story of Casey at the Bat informs all the decisions as they designed it. So if we come in, we step inside, this is what the menu is like. Um, you can see the, the drawings of the pitcher and the ball and Casey. And I don't wanna spoil it too much, but Casey's about to strike out. So the story is about the Mudville nine and their local game. And he's, you know, um, the bases are loaded, two outs, Casey, their best players up to bat and he can save the day and he doesn't. Uh, but they use this story in this local baseball game to inform all the decisions. If you notice the little enter signs underneath that, um, they all look like baseballs. Um, the employees all wear baseball uniforms. The counter looks like a concession stand. There are baseball pennants and pictures of baseball games on the walls. There are bats and other props. And there's a scoreboard that shows the end result of the game that the Mudville Nine did not beat the visitors. So every aspect of Casey's Corner is informed by its story. So when the Imagineers tell their stories, <clears throat> they decide on the story they're going to tell and they use it as the basis for all their decisions moving forward. So when they decide how are we going to decorate, what are we going to do, this is their source. For us, we need to be very clear about our subject matter and what we are trying to communicate. Um, and, you know, one of the ways this play, one of the, the ways this really manifests is uh, when we have to decide what to include and what to not include, because sometimes we're asked to include content that really belongs someplace else. So in my experience, we, we do, I document products that are uh, related to integrations. So it's, you know, I work in enterprise software, so we have a big customer relationship piece of software and we have um, a field work piece of software. So the customer calls and they look up their account and they're like, oh, we need to change your meter. So they have to send a message to the field work system to dispatch a crew to go do this. And there's integration software that makes those tools talk to each other. In my world, Oracle provides, so I work at Oracle, a bunch of tools that do integration. Um, uh, different tools if it's on-premises applications versus cloud applications. But the the core point here is that I don't want to talk about, when I'm talking about my customer relationship software, that's not where I should talk about the integration tools. I should talk about only as much as I need to so they understand how it works with it and what they have to do in that software to make the integration tool do what it does. But we need to be clear about what is our subject matter? What are we really telling our audience about? Um, because sometimes, uh, like I said, I'm asked to include lots more information than I should, you know, and so I don't, but sometimes we're, we're asked to do that. So this becomes a fundamental thing. And as we look at other examples, we're gonna come back to story because the story or subject matter is, gonna, is going to help us make decisions around these other principles. So next we're going to um, get closer to, so as we leave Casey's Corner, we are a little, we see the castle. This is about where we saw it before. As we get closer, um, we're going to see a different view. So this is about long, medium, and close shots. This is about creating an establishing shot and starting with a big broad picture and then moving in. And as we move in, more and more details become evident. So from that long shot before, you know, we see a castle, we don't see a lot of detail. As we move in, we see, we start to see the outlines of the bricks. We see the, the wrought iron lamp posts. As we get even closer, we see more detail. We start to see stained glass window and filigree and more detail of the bricks. If we go inside Cinderella Castle, inside the breezeway, we'll find a series of these mosaics. These are about 10 foot by 15 foot mosaics <clears throat> that tell the story of Cinderella. And then as we get, if we look even closer between the mosaics are pillars and at the tops of the pillars are these little sculptures of Zach and Gus and the birds that help Cinderella get dressed. So as we see, as we get closer, we start with a castle and then as we get a little closer, we see it's more of a fairy tale castle. And by the time we get really close, we get a lot of details that tell us it's Cinderella. Um, and so it's Cinderella castle. And so when the Imagineers tell their stories, 
<clears throat> they lead their audience from a general impression to specific scenes and details. In our work, we do this by organizing our content from the general to the specific, like we structure a paragraph. We have a topic sentence and then supporting sentences and, and presumably um, general content at the beginning of a section in more detail later. Um, this is one of those areas also where working with subject matter experts becomes interesting because a lot of times subject matter experts are uh, thinking stream of consciousness. And so we have to sometimes reorganize their content to make sure we're, we're starting at the big picture and then zooming into the details and provide more and more details as, as we get closer and closer um, into the content. So now we're at Cinderella Castle, we're gonna look at another um, uh, tool here. And this is something called Force Perspective, which is a theatrical tool that has to do with scale. So if we look at Cinderella Castle here, if we see these bricks, <clears throat> you see the brick patterns? Um, well, hold on, I'll, get, I'll come right back to that. Cinderella Castle looks to be about 300 to 350 feet tall when you're, when you're in the park, it looks ginormous. But it's really only 189 feet tall. Um, and that's because in, in Florida, anything 200 feet or higher needs to have an aircraft beacon on it. And that would spoil the, the story, right? Like to see a big blue or orange light at the top of that spire would really break our illusion of the story that we're, we're telling. So it's 189 feet tall. And the way they do that is through force perspective. We'll come back to the bricks. One of the techniques they use is the bricks, the size of these bricks that we see at the bottom here, they're bigger at the bottom than they are at the top. So as we look a little closer, here's another example. Those bricks way at the bottom of this picture are actually larger in scale than they are at the top near the rounded turret. And as we move up the structure, and here's another shot that sort of shows this, um, as you move up, the architectural details all get smaller and smaller in scale. So it looks like it's all the same size, but it's really, um, they use force perspective to scale it down. The same thing is true in all of uh, Magic King, um, sorry, Main Street USA. On Main Street USA, the, the floor facades, the first floor facades are actually 90% of what would normally be full size. The second ones are at 80%, and, and then third floors are even smaller than that. And so we think we see are seeing th three story buildings, but really they're not quite that big. Um, so it, it, it feels a little bit more intimate, but it, it uses this illusion of size. And so when the Imagineers tell their stories, they use the illusion of size. They make things look bigger than they are and sometimes smaller. And so there are some other examples, they use um, force perspective in reverse to actually make structures look smaller than they are. And so we use this to, um, to not overwhelm our audience. Like a lot of times we want to make things look a little simpler or smaller than they really are. So for instance, um, you know, how, how, can we, how can we use this in our stuff, in our content? Um, for instance, let's suppose we had a process that was 37 steps. That's kind of daunting. But if we can figure out ways to break that up or chunk it up into say, three groups of 10 and one group of seven, then it's four pieces, each of which has its own number, but it still feels a little smaller than it was. It doesn't feel like this monumentous, oh my God, I'll never get through it, 37 step process. So we can you know, look for ways to use the illusion of size to make our content or our concepts look smaller or larger in some cases. Usually we wanna make them smaller in, in, um, in our work, I think. So that's uh, Cinderella Castle. So now we're going to say one more time, one more thing in Cinderella Castle. We're actually going to go inside Cinderella Castle and look at something called creative intent. Now, remember I showed you that mosaic, those mosaics. Uh, along those, there is a doorway and it, and, and it opens into, on the left wall of the breezeway as you walk in, leads you to a shop called the Bippity Boppity Boutique. And this is a, a, uh, a shop where children can get a princess or prince makeover. Mostly girls go, but sometimes boys go too for the prince makeover. Um, and when we walk into the Bippity Boppity Boutique, we see this sign, this, this scroll, this proclamation, hear ye, hear ye, all loyal subjects of the Magic Kingdom. What this is doing is telling everybody that there's a ball tonight the Royal uh, Princess Cinderella and Prince Charming are going to be there and they're getting ready. 
this sets the stage for the Bippity Boppity Boutique um, in that uh, the, the original designer, uh, the, the art director for this was a, an Imagineer named Jason Grant. I happened to have lunch with him. Um, I did a, an event at, at uh, Disney World called Dine with an Imagineer. And he explained that he had, we had two intents with the, with the Bippity Boppity Boutique. One was to make an environment that men did not feel comfortable in. Um, but that was mostly a joke. Um, but the second one, more importantly, was that every girl or every child who's getting ready should feel like at any moment, Cinderella might walk through the door. And that's what this, this plaque does. Cinderella's getting ready for the ball too. The, 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 the children having their makeovers are getting ready for the ball that evening. And so Cinderella could come in any way. So this is what they call creative intent. Creative intent is the experience the designer wants the audience to have. And so they use this sign to sort of convey what's happening in the space. Another way the Imagineers convey con creative intent is by the brief descriptions that you might see on the, on the um, Disney website or the little guide maps they provide or the um, smartphone app that they use. So, you know, at the Haunted Mansion, we're climbing aboard a gloomy doom buggy for a grave journey through a labyrinth of haunted chambers. That encapsulates the experience that you're going to have. I'm not going to read all those others. You can. Um, but so creative intent, again, is the, the experience the designer wants us to have, and it's their objective. And so when the Imagineers tell their story, they stay focused on their objective and their reasons for telling the story throughout the process. This, along with the story, are these are two of the things they, de they decide on very, very early in the process. And they use it as a filter for many of their decisions moving forward. So as they decide, you know, what, uh, how do we want to decorate the Haunted Mansion? Well, we want to make sure that it, that it really helps uh, bring to life this haunted mood and this gloomy, um, spooky experience. Uh, when they're decorating Pirates of the Caribbean, they want to make sure that it invokes that whole era of prior pirates and privateers. So they use creative intent as a filter. We need to remember our objective when we're writing our content. You know, are we writing, what type of content are we doing? Are we trying to tell somebody how to use the software? So I'm going to use software a lot in my examples. I apologize now. That's the world I work in. Um, but, you know, are we trying to explain how to use something, how to install something, how to build something, how to troubleshoot, et cetera. What is our objective? And that should be a filter for what type of content we include. So that's our creative intent. So now we're gonna leave uh, Main Street and, and the castle. We're gonna head over to Liberty Square and we're gonna look at a, um, a principle called attention to detail. Now detail is something that's, um, very big with the with Disney. Disney is great, for, well known for its attention to detail, uh, and Liberty Square happens to be one of my favorite places to look at. And so we're going to just look at a few examples here. Um, there is a building, the the Christmas tree shops, where there's a sign on it as you can see. You know this picture here is music and voice lessons by Ichabod Crane. So that instantly tells us we're talking about the legend of Sleepy Hollow, and it sort of sets the tone and the and the time frame for where this period, you know, where this this land is taking place. Um, on the same building, a different part of the same building, there's this little sign, Keppel. Keppel is actually Walt Disney's grandfather's name. His name was Keppel Disney, and so there's these kinds of details that are that are slipped in. Um, there's uh, an area called the Court of Flags where there's 13 flags, one for the original, each of the original colonies. This is the Massachusetts one. That's where I'm from. So that's what I took. Um, and it's got certain details of when it was when it was founded. If you look up at the windows on the higher story buildings, uh, higher stories, and you look at the windows, you'll see that the shutters are actually crooked. And that's because in colonial times, um, metal was needed for ammunition and weapons, and so they actually made shutters out of leather, and the leather has stretched, and so they're, they're actually crooked. Um, in one of the buildings, if you look up there, you'll, at night, you'll see the two lanterns. That's reminiscent of two, one if by land, two if by sea, the, the ride of Paul Revere. Um, and then this is an interesting thing. Throughout all of Liberty Square, most of the pavement is this red color, pink color that you see on either side, but through the middle of every, there is a path of this grayish, brownish, 
stuff. Um, now, if you were to go to a cast member in Liberty Square and ask where the nearest restroom is, they would tell you that there are no restrooms in Liberty Square because there was no public, there were no public restrooms in colonial times. And this is true, there are no restrooms in Liberty Square because there weren't any public restrooms in colonial times. This gray streak reinforces that because that's what people did with their waste. They dropped it in the street. So this gray streak runs through all of Liberty Square as a constant reminder of the time. It's a yet another detail that brings this, that really helps tell the story. So when the Imagineers tell their story, they pay, pay attention to every detail. There's nothing they do that is just, oh, I think it should be blue. They never are that cavalier about anything. Um, there's actually a story about an ep, um, one of the pavilions at Epcot when they were building the Living Seas. Um, one of the executives from the sponsoring company <clears throat> said to one of the Imagineers, just paint it white. And the Imagineer, a gentleman named John Hench, his response was, sir, I have 33 shades of white in my palette. Which one do you mean? Um, they're very focused on detail. And so obviously in our work, we need to pay attention to detail. We need to make sure the details in our examples and our, in our content are accurate because incorrect details lead to bad results. Another facet of this principle is the idea or the, the notion that detail draws attention to itself. The more detail you provide, the more important your audience is going to think it is. So we need to be careful about the level of detail we provide and the types of details we provide to make sure we're not um, leading our audience down a bad path or making them think something's more important than it really needs to be. And sometimes that's as simple as it. not not adjectives as in make it exciting, but sometimes we use descriptive terms that we don't need to because they may, you know, we could tighten things up and make sure that we don't, you know, convey something a little different than what our audience needs to know. So we're gonna leave Liberty Square. We're gonna head over to Adventureland now. We're gonna talk about something called pre-shows. Uh, at Disney World, it's very rare for you to be in the main walkway and just be on a ride or an attraction. There's always something in between a buffer of some sort and generally a queue, you know, where you wait in line because it's very rare that you get to walk right on anything. These days you can because the parks are very, very empty, um, but everyone's wearing masks. Um, but most attractions have what they call a pre-show. And so we're gonna start and we're gonna look at, start, look for this. We're gonna look at an example of Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. This was one of the first attractions to use audio animatronics. Um, and when we walk in, when you approach and you come to the sign, you go to the right of the sign, there's a little, um, you go through some turnstiles and a little, there's a curved walkway that sort of surrounds a lagoon. And at the far end of the lagoon, there's this wall and this little temple. And about five or 10 minutes before the show really starts and they open the doors, this opens and we see these two tiki bird, these two toucans. And they tell us the story. And these are Clyde and Claude, I believe. Um, I have their names written down somewhere, but I don't have that paper with me. Um, and they tell a story about the, the tropical parrot of the tropical serenade, which is the original name of the attraction. And they set the stage and basically introduce the story that you're about to experience. And so when the Imagineers tell their stories, they introduce the audience to the story before the story even starts. They, they prepare the audience for what they're going to experience. In our case, in our world of technical communication, I view this as overviews, either overview chapters or an overview paragraph at the beginning of a section. Um, this also speaks to that old public speaking adage of tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and tell them what you told them. This is the tell them what you're going to tell them part. We wanna make sure the audience knows what they're going to experience before they do, because it helps introduce them. It gives them some context. So, so that's a pre-show. So now we're gonna leave the Tiki Room and move across to the other side of Adventureland. And we're going to look at something called readability. And we're gonna look at that here in Pirates of the Caribbean. So um, in Pirates of the Caribbean is what we, what's known as a dark ride. Um, it's a little bit more elaborate than some of the other dark rides like Peter Pan's Flight 
or Snow White's Adventure or Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, <clears throat> both of which are at Disneyland, not at Disney World anymore. But, um, but basically during a dark ride, the audience moves constantly through a number of scenes and only has a few seconds to understand what's going on. And so one of the ways the Imagineers address this is to create scenes that are readable and understandable. And so Pirates is a couple of good examples of that. As you enter the queue, um, you walk down a hallway and it makes basically a, a, a U-turn. At the end of this little walkway that you're on, you'll see a big <clears throat> stone wall. The, the queue is like inside an old Spanish fort and you'll see a window. And if you look down through the barred window, you'll see this scene here and these are pirates playing chess. Well, and in just a few seconds, we understand what this is. <clears throat> the pirates got into stalemate and never left the game. We don't need a paragraph to explain it. We don't need much. We look at it within a handful of seconds, we understand what's happened. Another example, perhaps my favorite, is this scene, the jail scene at the end. At the end of the ride, we're, uh, the city is on fire. We come around, we come into the jail. And what we can't see here in this picture is behind the, the people, behind the pirates in this jail cell, the building is on fire behind them. So they're pretty, pretty invested in getting out. But again, this is a scene where you see it very quickly. You see the pirates, you see the dog, and you see the key in their mouth, and you quickly understand what it is. So they create these very readable scenes to help us understand what we're experiencing. So when the Imagineers tell their stories, they simplify complex subjects. They look for different ways to take complex ideas and simplify them and convey them effectively. Now we, can, we do this in illustrations or, or diagrams. We might use metaphors or analogies, anything we can do to simplify complex subjects and, and make our audience and help our audience understand what we're going through. We want to look for different ways to do that. <clears throat> so now we're going to leave uh, Adventureland and we're going to head over to Frontierland. And here there's a couple attractions right next to each other. One is Splash Mountain, which is a log flume ride inspired by the animated sequences from Song of the South. And <clears throat> right next to it is Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, which is uh, based on a, basically a mine car through a haunted mountain through a haunted mountain. Now, both of these are, as I said, are in frontier land and they share some thematic, some, some theme, theming elements. And, and by that, I mean details and, um, and the treatment. In, uh, in frontier land, you will never find a polished steel handrail. All the handrailings or fences are wooden or, or fiberglass made to look like wood at least. Um, Likewise, in Tomorrowland, you won't see, you know, bamboo thatch like you would in, in Adventureland. And so um, all of Frontierland has this very rustic wooden look. And these two are right next to each other, but they use um, this rustic look in slightly different ways to help really convey the specifics of their story. So if we look at some examples of Splash Mountain, this picture is the, the hill of Splash Mountain in the background there. And you can see the... Um, the red earth and the grass and the brambles. But when you look at it, you realize it doesn't look real. It looks like it's an, a, um, a real world or a 3D version of an animated scene. It's pulled right out of animation. It's designed to look animated like these, this doorway and window, the wood here, even though it might be, you know, quote real, it's designed to look as if it's an animated scene brought to life, not uh, a more real world example, like over at Big Thunder Mountain, the structures are designed to look much more realistic, quote, realistic. Now, again, it's fictional, but it's, but it looks more like it came from the real world as an animated world. These two sort of are a good juxtaposition, I think. And so with theming, when the Imagineers tell their stories, <clears throat> they use appropriate details to strengthen their story and support their creative intent. So they look for ways to use whatever details they can to make sure they really bring those their you know their own story and their their objective out. Um, now this can take a number of different forms for us. You know, obviously we want to use appropriate details. If if so, my um, the software I work with is used by utility companies, and if I'm trying to explain a concept about electric rates, electric utility rates, I do not want to use examples or details about water rates. 
that's a simple example, but it help, hopefully it helps drive it home. We want to be careful and use appropriate details. Uh, another way that theming shows up in our world is through templates and standards. Um, we want to make sure we're using consistent styles and fonts and colors because those things, when they're different, really take the audience out of the experience. I recall very vividly, I was taking it, I was doing a training done through um, Joanne Hackhouse company, actually, it was um, from Comtech Services, and it was a training about ditto or minimalism. And the slides were very consistent, one font for the heading, one font for the body, boom, 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 all of a sudden, we came to a slide with two other text boxes with completely different fonts in them. And it pulled me completely out of the experience. And I didn't care what he was talking about. I wanted to know why he used a different font. Now, I might be a little weird, and that might be a thing more unique to me. But the thing about theming is when it's done well, it disappears and we don't notice it. But when it's done inconsistently and badly, it shows up and, we, and it draws attention to itself. And it's an example of a detail drawing attention to itself. So I want to show you a more extreme example of that. A, an extreme bad example of theming. So here's a, a, a different type of slide that I might have used to talk about this subject. Now, in this, you notice all of a sudden the background is different, the heading is centered, there's five or six different fonts, different sizes, different colors, the animation comes in in different ways. I even used the wrong word, Disney Imaginers instead of Imagineers. Again, a very extreme example, but I hope it helps illustrate that um, you know, if you ever work on slides and somebody says, you know, use the template, they're not doing it. Well, we all know we sort of come from that world. But if you've ever worked with people who are preparing content and you have to remind them to use the template and apply the styles from the template, it's because it helps take a whole part of the message away. By making that consistent, they can worry about the content and not the presentation as much. So that's, so that's theming. So we're in the tier land. <clears throat> now, right as we exit um, Big Thunder Mountain, there's a big a place, a little sign that we see in the exit way called Nugget Way. And if we follow the sign, follow sort of the arrow that it's pointing up, it leads us to a walkway. All right, you see this rock work with this spout, this geyser. And to get closer, uh, we come across this in area with more geysers that go off a few seconds. Every couple of minutes, these geysers go off in different, right? And then around, as you can see in the back on there, around that fenced area, we can get a good look at the train cars from Big Thunder Mountain moving, uh, running by us. Um, and then if we were to leave that and head back down, we might come to the spot which is near the runoff of Splash Mountain. So there's Splash Mountain in the background. You can see log coming out of the top of it, and then the other log, the water's rushing in front. Now behind us, I can't get it in the picture, is the Rivers of America, and there's a steamboat, a steam like a, a ship that moves around, floats around, and there's rafts. And so there's movement everywhere, there's kinetics and activity everywhere. There are very, very few still and quiet places at Disney parks, and that's by design. Because when the Imagineers tell their stories, they keep the experience dynamic and active. They keep it engaging. And they want to engage their audience and, and keep, keep the experience active. And so um, we can do this. Now, it's a lot harder in, you know, in, in our medium of text. It's somewhat hard to keep things dynamic and active. But if we think about um, approaches like, um, oh, now I can't remember what it is, information mapping. For example, they talk about not using walls of words and they talk about breaking it up. So maybe we break up our content with some you know, regular text. We might use bulleted lists. We might use tables. We might use illustrations. Things to just break up the experience um, to keep it a little bit more dynamic and active. Now, obviously, if we're talking about slide content, you can use animation like I have. If we're doing video, that helps keep it active. Sometimes with online help, we might use embedded video. Um, so, but whatever we can do to sort of keep the audience, you know, just to keep it a little bit more active, it's just not page after page after page after page of text. Sometimes we do have to do that, admittedly, but if we can mix things up all the more, all the better. <clears throat> so now we're going to leave Frontier and we're going to come back into, into Liberty Square and we're going to talk about another principle. I don't want to tell you what it is yet because that kind of gives it away. 
um, we come up, we're going to go to the Haunted Mansion now. So this is a shot of the Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion is right at the end of, of Liberty Square, right as it borders Fantasyland. When we get into the Haunted Mansion, we, we enter through the foyer, we go into the stretching room where the big stretching portraits are. I don't know if all of you have been there, but I should have asked, but those of you who have know what I'm talking about. Um, and then we eventually board doom buggies and we ride through the mansion and we go past the library and, and we eventually get to, <clears throat> we go by the seance, we get to the, the ballroom. And as we exit the ballroom, we go into the attic scene. And when we get to the attic, if we look to the left, as we enter the attic, we're gonna see this and some chairs and stuff and these pile of plates. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but if you look closely, those pile, those plates are not random or haphazard. They're for, in the shape of a Mickey Mouse head. And they are an example of what, what's known as a hidden Mickey. Hidden Mickeys are, like the name implies, hidden, sometimes not so well, um, impressions of Mickey Mouse that the Imagineers plant um, throughout, throughout the attractions. And there's books of them and there's scavenger hunts and you can look for them in all sorts of places. Um, but, but the interesting thing about hidden Mickeys is once you see one, you never see it the same way twice. You never see it differently again. You always, like from now on, I'll always see these plates as the Mickey first and then I'll see them as, as a bunch of junk under some chairs. And the same may be true for you. I may have spoiled it for you. But the point is it, once we see them, we never see things the same way again and we see this experience in a different way. When the Imagineers tell their stories, they involve and engage their audience and help them see things in a new way. And they make, and Hidden Mickeys is one of the ways they do this. They also use something that, that's often referred to as five-legged goats, which are sort of like Easter eggs. When we think about Easter eggs in movies, you know, like a reference to, I can't even think of a good example right now. Um, in Man of Steel, the, um, the satellite that crashes is, the, there's a satellite that's, built by Wayne Enterprises, which is, of course, Bruce Wayne, who's Batman. So little, little things like that. In the Imagineering world, um, they'll embed the names of other designers or Imagineers. Um, they may include other in-jokes. Now, it got its name Five-Legged Goats because in the contemporary resort at Disney World, um, there is a giant, there's, in the Grand Canyon concourse, there's a giant three oh, multi-story mosaic picture um, and hidden amongst them is a five-legged goat, um, which is not too hard to find these days, but it's one of those little things that's just sort of like a, an in-joke, like an Easter egg or something. So again, they, they involve and engage the audience to have them interact with their content. Now, in our world, we might do that by allowing, looking for ways to allow our audience to sort of put the pieces together. Now, we, you know, Upfront, we don't want to not tell our audience what they need to know. But in a learning experience or training experience, if you can organize your content and organize your lessons so such that your students actually say, oh, you told us about ABC. Now I understand how they fit with DEF. Now I get it. And they put it together themselves. They're going to remember it far more than if you tell them. So I have another, another example of this whole see it a different way um, that we're going to look at now. So this is um, about engaging your audience and what I'm calling it the missing piece. So these are some lines. Um, and what do you see? Now I'm going to give you, and please don't spoil it for anybody else, but I'll give you a few more clues as we go through. Um, first, this is something all of us, particularly as writers, use every single day. Um, it's the capital version of the most common letter in the English language, and the object appears in the white space. So by now, you probably have put it together that this is basically the letter E. If you hadn't seen it before, now you do, and now the next time you see this, you will see the letter E. It's one of those experiences. Once your brain puts it together a certain way, we never see it the other way. And so again, if we can figure out ways to do that with our content, and again, particularly this works with training sort of better than, than documentation since much of our documentation is as much a reference as, as anything else. Um, this is gonna help our audience remember what they've experienced. So 
So now we are at the Haunted Mansion, which is at the border of Fantasyland uh, between Liberty Square and Fantasyland. And so we're going to talk about transitions. And this is how, uh, when, the, when the Imagineers design their experiences, they, they are thoughtful to make sure that as, as things change, uh, it contributes, whatever that changes, it contributes to the story and it doesn't jar the audience too much. It doesn't take them out of the experience too much. So this is the this is the crossway from where I'm standing now, where this picture taking was taken, is in Liberty Square. And if you see the ground, it's all that grayish brown stuff that I told you about earlier. Across the way, through this little archway or passageway, is Fantasyland. And so what they do is they they the Imagineers use different visual cues to help us transition from this colonial Victorian actually in this case, Upper Hudson River, where we are now, um, New England area to this fantasy land. So what they do is they, they use architectural details um, from the other side. So for example, right to the left of the picture that we saw, if you look at the stonework, that doesn't really fit in Liberty Square, but it looks pretty similar to what you might see on Cinderella Castle. So it's got a more fantasy land look to it. If we go on the other side, now from here, we're actually on the fantasy land side. We see this wrought iron side from Memento Mori. That is a shop that's related to the Haunted Mansion. And some of that woodwork does look a little bit colonial. So they use different architectural techniques on either side to sort of create a, a cross dissolve. And one of the specific details they use in this example is these pillars. So we're gonna look at this. So if we're, we're right now I'm coming from fantasy land into, into Liberty Square. In the foreground, I have this stone pillar carved. It looks like it might belong with Cinderella Castle. In the background, I see this round colonial style one. As I move closer, the stone pillar starts to fade out of view and the, and the round wooden pillar becomes more prominent in my view. And as I get even closer, it is the main view. So I went from Fantasyland into Liberty Square and I sort of did this cross dissolve. If we look at it from the other way, coming from Liberty Square now, we see this <clears throat> round colonial style pillar and in the background, not very prominent, there's this stone thing. As we move closer, the round pillar begins to fade out of our field of vision and the stone pillar becomes more prominent. And again, as we get closer, it takes up, it becomes even more prominent. So this is another example, an example of this cross dissolve they use. So when the Imagineers tell their stories, they make sure that changes in the experience from Liberty Square to Fantasyland or vice versa, and the way that change is experienced serve the story they're telling so that um, they don't represent this jarring difference. They, they, make, <clears throat> they make sure the audience has a, a sort of smooth transition. In our world, this is all about, it, well, I shouldn't say all about, but one of the main things where this comes into play is in how we order and sequence our content, right? A lot of times I mentioned earlier that sometimes subject matter experts will um, provide content that is somewhat stream of consciousness. And so we need to often take that and restructure it and rework it to make sure we're talking about uh, installation before configuration as a simple example. It sounds simple, but I've gotten content that talks about installing after configuration, which is because it's not how they, they don't think that way. Um, sometimes in training, particularly, um, we actually want to use a different order than we might than might be practiced in the real world. Um, let's say we have a process that is seven, four steps, sorry, four steps, but step three has three subparts to it. So we have one, step one, step two, step three, A, B, C, D, and step, sorry, just A, B, C, and then step four. Um, in a training exercise, if we were going through reconfiguring, um, again, in my world software that involves these four steps with these sub steps, what I might do is say step one, we do X, step, step one, we do this, step two, we do that, step three, we do this. There are sub steps to this. We're going to get in more detail, but we'll come back to that. Let's do step four and then come back and do steps A, B, and C again under, under that first step three. Now, the reason we might want to do that is because we don't want to get too deep in the weeds about these little sub steps where they lose perspective of where they are and what they're doing. So sometimes we want to break up the, the order in which we do things a little differently if it helps smooth out the experience uh, for, the, for our audience. 
Okay. So now we're into fantasy land and we're going to talk about something called the it's a small world effect. And this has all to do with it's a small world. Now, if you've ever been on this ride, I just put that song in your head. I know it. And if you haven't, you probably know the song anyway. Uh, and to me, this is not a bad thing. I love this song. This is um, a song Richard, uh, written by the Sherman Brothers, the same people who did the music for Mary Poppins um, and another a number of other um, attractions, in, including the Enchanted Tiki Room that we saw earlier. Um, the Disney experience, Disney park experience is designed to be memorable. They want you to remember it. They want you to come back. Um, and one of the ways they do that is through repetition and reinforcement. And one of the ways they do repetition is through songs. They want songs that are memorable. Uh, there's a story. So the It's a Small World is one of four attractions that was originally designed for the 1964, 1965 World's Fair, New York World's Fair. Um, and when they were working on the attraction, this It's a Small World for the World's Fair, uh, there's a story about at the end of a day when they were you know, walking out, somebody was talking with Walt and they said, wow, you're spending a lot of time working on that song. And his response was, well, people don't come out humming the architecture. Um, so he knew that it's a fundamental thing that people pay attention to. And so they want to make sure that it's memorable. So when the Imagineers tell their stories, they use repetition and reinforcement to help make that audience experience memorable. Again, one of the ways they do that is, is through song. Um, they're just very consistent in their messaging. They're con consistent in their use of fonts, like when at Disney World, if you get guide maps and you look through the, the map, you will almost always see the word Disney in that little scripty font. It won't just be written out. Um, so they use repetition and reinforcement in, in a number of ways. In our world, we don't want to be redundant, but uh, repetition and redundancy are not the same thing. You know, if there's if something is important enough to tell somebody, your audience about it, it might be important enough to tell them more than once, right? Particularly if if they might make a mistake and break something or create, you know, irreparable, you know, once you create a record of this type, you can't delete it. You might want to tell them more than one time to make sure they do it correctly. So we need to use repetition and reinforcement um, where applicable to make sure that our audience remembers the important stuff. And so uh, <clears throat> we're going to stay in Fantasyland for our last, last principle which is something called a post show. So we talked about pre shows before. Tell your odd, tell them what they're gonna, what you're gonna tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them. Post shows are the other side of this. To tell them what you told them, and we're gonna look at an example of this in Mickey's Philharmagic. Uh, Mickey's Philharmagic is an, is a, a theater experience, a 3D movie where we go in, and the story begins with the uh, magical orchestra getting ready and Mickey's gonna conduct the orchestra using his sorcerer hat. You see, he's wearing the sorcerer hat there. Um, and he puts the hat down, but he has to, you know, it's not quite showtime yet. And he walks away and he tells Donald to not touch his hat, uh, which is the wrong thing to tell Donald Duck. So Donald touches the hat and ends up bringing the audience, the um, orchestra to life and ends up in a whirlwind and finds himself traveling through a number of different animated Disney animated films. He starts in Beauty and the Beast, he ends up in Peter Pan, in The Lion King, um, under the Sea in The Little Mermaid, uh, and even in Aladdin, on the Magic Carpet Ride in Aladdin, and I think I may have even forgotten one. Oh, in Sorcerer's Apprentice, he actually gets in the, in the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and it's a great show. Uh, there's there's um, special effects where at one point in the Beauty and the Beast scene, we see an apple pie. It's a 3D show, the apple pie floats in our face, and they actually pump in the smell of apple pie. Uh, in the sources apprentice when the but when the the broomsticks are carrying the buckets they splash water on the audience so you get little drops of water splashed in your face it's a really neat show at the end uh donald ends up in another whirlwind and back on the stage with the magical orchestra and he ends up in the tuba and the tuba and en ends up blowing him out and over the audience and he crashes into the wall behind us and if we turn around we actually see him sticking out the wall um, and then as he sits there, he starts to fall, and then eventually he falls, and we hear him say, uh-oh, and then that's the end of the show. So we're escorted out, we return our opera glasses, which are our 3D glasses, and we will come up a, a walkway, which leads us by a gift shop. Um, 
And if we walk into the gift shop, we see this. We see Donald Duck falling down from the ceiling through a bunch of musical instruments, which reinforces the scene we just saw. This is a way to remind us and, and remind us, uh, uh, you know, to, to reinforce the message and the story that we did. So tell them what you told them, tell them, sorry, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. This is reminding us what we just saw. And this happens to be, like I said, in a, in a gift shop. Um, that's what's sometimes referred to in the industry as exit through retail. Um, and sometimes, you know, a retail might be a post show. Other, other um, attractions have different types of post shows. Sometimes it's an interactive thing. This happens to be a retail one, but, but this is one of my favorite examples because it ties the Donald Duck uh, bit. So that's our tour through the Magic Kingdom. Oh, sorry, but we need to talk about wrap up our experience here. When the Imagineers tell their stories, they reinforce the key themes and ideas from the story to help you stay engaged. So this might be summary content. You know, in when we do training, we definitely want to do summaries at the end of each lesson. Um, in in you know online documentation or user documentation, sometimes <clears throat> this is a little trickier because. Well, all too often our audience is looking for the answer they want and then they're going to be done. No one except us reads these things from beginning to end, um, or very rarely at least. But, but still, if we can find ways to reinforce the key ideas from our content and our story, it might help the audience stay engaged and, and have a takeaway at the end. So one more principle. I don't have a picture for this one, but it's something called plussing. This is a term Walt coined for making things better. Walt always talked about plussing. He was always trying to do more and more and more. Now, some of some of that was new technological innovation, like he did the first synchronized sound with Steamboat Willie. He did first uh, full color animation with flowers and trees. Um, then he did, I, I don't remember, it might be the old windmill where he introduced the, the um, Oh, now I can't remember what it is. The multiplane camera where we actually have depth and stuff. So Walt was always looking for new technological things, but he also just wanted to make things better and plus things. And so this is about improvement through iteration and a continual focus on constant improvement. So when the Imagineers tell their stories, they consistently ask themselves, how do we make this better? So we may do this in my world from release to release. We may Sometimes deadlines and other pressures force us to um, release content um, that might not be as polished as it could be. Uh, that's just an unfortunate truth. But as long as we remember that and next time we go back and polish, then we're constantly plussing. So um, we just need to constantly look at how can we improve and do, do what we do a little bit better. Okay. So let's look at a couple examples of these, of these principles from our world. I've tried to share a few, but I want to look at a couple concrete ones. So this is an example chapter, um, an introductory chapter. I'm very big on introductory overview chapters. I still write content in books for the most part. And, I, and I'm a firm believer that these help because they help establish context and they introduce the audience to what they're going to read. Um, now, in this case, this is the introduction section for a guide about Oracle object storage that's used with Oracle Utilities Cloud Services. Um, so this very chapter serves as a pre-show. I mean, this you're looking at the, con the whole of this chapter. It's this one page. It's basically this very introductory section, but it serves as a pre-show that tells the audience what they're going to see if they dig into this book. This top box is our story. It's This is our subject matter. This is about Oracle Cloud object storage and using it with Oracle Cloud, Oracle Utilities Cloud Services. It also is a long shot. It establishes a very big picture of what we're going to see, but it doesn't drill into the details yet. This box below explains our creative intent. This guide provides information about blah, 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 blah very clearly states, well, hopefully clearly states our, our objective with this documentation. And these bullet points, these advanced organizers serve as weenies. So if I'm, if I'm looking in this document and I'm interested in testing, I know, oh, there's a section on testing. I want to understand that and that's where I'm going to go. So that's simple. Uh, this is just a very simple example. Um, 
but hopefully it illustrates how some of these principles come to life in, in tech writing. Here's another example. In the software that we produce, we have a product called Oracle Utilities Customer to Meter, which is a customer information system that uses a number of objects to define a customer that include a customer, which can have more, more one account, which can have each of which can have one or more service agreements, a premise or service location, which can have one or more service points, each of which can have one or more meters, and then records that connect all that. Now that's not that complicated, but it's more words than I would like to use. Right, and it's it's easy to get lost. So instead, we could use a diagram like this as an example of readability. This diagram shows us we have service location, meter location, and the the service point on the geographic side, and then the demographic side we have the customer account and service agreement, and then a little SASP relationship record there in the middle tied together. So this is an example of simplifying a complex subject. Now, again, not the most complex subject, but it's still hopefully illustrates my point. So do we have any questions now before I get to the checklist um, section? And I haven't even paid attention to how my timing is. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that, Lou, you're fine. I do have one question to kind of start things off then. What would you say are like the most integral uh, principles from the, from the Imagineers that are some of the trickiest or the hardest that are the people for, tend to forget the most? On our side, you mean? Um, I think um, transitions is one that we just need to think about, you know, what's the best way to organize content? I mean, obviously, sometimes it's obvious you need to install before you configure, but sometimes it's not always so obvious. So we need to be mindful of that. And again, particularly when we enter our train, a training world, really thinking about the order in which we organize and present our information is, is one. Um, I think theming, you know, as, as in the jobs that we do, we tend to um, think details are good, but we need to be careful about the details we share because we need to make sure that they're appropriate and that they help tell the story we're telling and convey the subject matter we're, we're talking about and don't get in the way, you know? And sometimes they can because they can draw the audience's attention to that. Um, sometimes, I mean, most of us are probably already anal and retentive about formatting and styles and stuff, but not paying attention to your templates and stuff can, can cause, just because people notice that stuff even subconsciously sometimes. Um, so those are some some things that come off the top of my head in terms of things to you know that are kind of important. I mean, story is obviously important. You need to know what really you are saying, and what you don't need to say, um, as well as your creative intent. You know, why are you saying it in the first place? What's the objective here? Because um, sometimes, again, subject matter experts will say we need to say X Y Z, and you're like, no, we don't. It really doesn't fit in what we're, <laughs> the objective as we've defined, it does not fit those things. Um, so those are a couple. Do you have any other questions from anybody else? And we can, we can take a couple minutes at the end for questions again, too. That's absolutely fine, too. So now, and I can make these, I can make a PDF of this available to everybody if they, if you want. Um, for each of these principles, I have a number of a checklist with questions that can help you sort of narrow in, zero in and focus on these. So, and I've organized them in the order. Um, so these are the same principles that I talk about in that first book, The Imagineering Pyramid. Um, but in the pyramid, they're in a little different order. Um, so, you know, uh, this time I put them in the order that we did in our walk through the Magic Kingdom. Um, in terms of weenies, you know, what kind of weenie makes sense? A visual weenie. Um, now, I didn't talk about them, but there are other types of weenies that the Imagineers use. Um, if you walk by the bakery, you smell cookies. And that is what I call an aromatic weenie. Like it tells you, hey, there's something in here. Come and get it. Um, over at Epcot, at Test Track, you can hear the car zoom around as you approach. And that's just a sort of thing to get you interested in what's happening. Um, you know, could you use creative language to entice your audience? Can you use graphic design to capture their audience? Um, for story, what is your story and subject matter? And are you basing your decisions about that? And have you excluded tangential subjects? Um, I don't wanna read all of these, obviously, you know, 
have you thought about what is your establishing shot, your medium shot, and your close up, and how you want to organize your content? Um, can you adjust your audience's perspective, and can you help shrink the size of your message? Can you use grouping and chunking to sort of change the size of, you know, sometimes the concepts we document are big and hairy. We need to figure out ways to make them seem a little more friendly. Um, for creative intent, it's important that we understand our audience, our objective, you know, and what is the experience you want your audience to have when they read your documentation? What do you want them to know when they've, after they've read your content? Um, are you pay, paying attention to details? Does your detail support your creative intent? Does it support your story? Uh, where's, and the line between too much and too little is a fine one to be sure. But whenever, I would say that whenever you're not, whenever you're um, distracting your audience from your goal is probably when you've provided too much detail. Um, in terms of pre-shows, how are you introducing your story? Um, in terms of readability, are you simplifying complex ideas? Could you use illustrations or examples to make your content a little more digestible and readable? Um, are you being consistent in your language and terminology and templates and styles and colors? Are you using details that support but don't distract your audience? Um, can you keep your, your content active and dynamic? Again, kind of hard in some of what we do in tech writing, but just by breaking up the content in different ways, we can do that. Um, how can you engage and involve, involve your audience? Are, is there a way for you to get your audience to see things on their own and see things in a different way? Um, how can you do transitions? Are there specific things you can use to help create different transitions? Are you avoiding abrupt change? Um, do, you need to, do you need to present content in a different way than they might do it in the real world to help more effectively communicate in the moment? Um, are you using repetition? Are you using repetition? Um, when I actually wrote this in my book, I had to put a note for the editor. Yes, I meant that on purpose. <laughs> I include, I, I duplicated the line, but I wanted him to know. Yeah, editor note. Yes, repetition here is intentional. Um, see, I include there, I guess. In post shows, are you reinforcing and then plusing? How can you make it better? Now, this question about WDI show quality standards. I, I didn't talk about it. Um, but one of the teams of within Imagineering, what WDI stands for, is what's called show quality standards. And their whole job is to everything looks good and identify things for quality improvement. So do you have the equivalent of that? Do you have a team that evaluates your content every so often with this goal of making it better? You know. So to wrap up again, I'm happy to stay on and chat about this as long as you want. Um, I believe technical communication and information development are creative fields. I don't think of them that way too often, but I believe they, I believe there's creativity. We need creativity in everything we do. We all have creative problems to solve. I think ideas and insights can come from unlikely sources. I think Disney parks are somewhat unlikely source of communication. And I hope that some of the ideas that I'll share tonight you consider useful or insightful. Um, and a visit to a Disney park can be fun as well as a research. So maybe you could get it expensed. Unlikely, but you never know. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I've, I, again, I'm happy to stay on. I'm gonna stop sharing, but we're, I'm happy to stay on and chat some more. Um, so I, I, and I know the chat was, um, I saw some questions in the chat, but I didn't wanna go over and look and see what they were. We missed too many questions in the chat, but if we could have everyone, I'm going to give a little big round of applause. That was a fantastic talk. Well, thank you very much. A little big. Actually, you were just perfect on time, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but yeah, this is fantastic. Lou, thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll go and stop the recording. Now.